evening, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. I love Baton Rouge. I've lived here for about uh, two years. It's been great. Coming from the southern Europe, the southern United States, it's uh, not much of a change, as you imagine, but it's still fun. So as my last name suggests, I'm originally from Greece. And you know, we go back millennia of astronomical science and astronomical observations. Actually, this guy right here is Eratosthenes, and he's the first person who measured the circumference of the Earth. And then if you fast forward 2,000 years, this is what he would look like. Uh, but, by the way, that wouldn't, that's not my boat. I wish I had a boat, although I looked like I had a boat. Uh, but you can see the similarity right there, right? It's the same person. Change the name a little bit. But anyhow, I think every single person in this room has experienced and enjoyed some kind of sky explosion, some kind of bang. You know, we all love to celebrate the 4th of July. We've seen fireworks in the sky during this great celebration. We've also, there's some space banks that are a little dangerous. There's those kind of things, asteroids that can hit the Earth and cause a lot of damage sometimes. Uh, we're not quite welcome. And that's what actually happened in Russia back in 2013. There was an asteroid that cracked a lot of windows. And sometimes we experience banks because of sheer human stupidity. <laughs> So this is not the kind of bugs we're going to be talking about. And there is also bugs we experience from our favorite science fiction movies. So this is the best star going past in Star Wars. Well, what I'm going to be talking about is actual explosions of stars. Really massive stars, things that are more than 10, 20 times the mass of our sun. So I invite every single one of you to find a clear, moonless night Drive away from Baton Rouge in the country line and look at the beautiful sky. And you will see a lot of stars in the sky, uh, those little bright dots over there. But maybe some of you, you wouldn't know that 90% of those dots are actually stars very similar to the sun. You know, regular mass, regular, about the size of the sun, about the mass of the sand. Only 10% of these stars are massive enough and big enough to have a really violent death, a supernova explosion. And that's what we're gonna be talking about, supernova explosion. Now I like to compare this to pebbles on a beach. If you look at a beach, you will find a lot of small rocks and only a few bigger rocks, kind of like in this picture. Same thing goes with stars. There's just a lot of stars like the sun out there. Just only a few stars that are massive enough, 10% of what you see in the night sky, that go boom in a massive supernova explosion. Now, we like to call this transient astrophysics. You know, kind of like a firework, things just go boom and then they disappear. They go bright and then they fade away. This is what a transient is. It turns out if you look at the sky, there's a lot of transient events happening every single second of different categories. There's, it's a zoo out there, as a matter of fact. As I said before, there's stars that just blow up supernova explosions. Uh, in some cases, you have comets coming by. That's a transient event. You might have a star that's getting awfully close to a supermassive black hole in the center of a distant galaxy, and the black hole is going to rip it apart, and it's going to create a really luminous flare that's going to become bright and then fade away. That's a tidal disruption event. That's a, that's a type of transient. And you have all kinds of other things happening. So what I'm trying to convey with this is that the sky is not static. Things change all the time. And the way we try to study in astronomy the things that change is by collecting light from them. So I don't want to get into the technical details here, but I want you to focus on this right diagram right here. Basically, what this is called a light curve. What it shows is how something gets bright over time. So a supernova, for example, a stellar explosion, will get bright over a few days and then fade away. That's what we call a light curve. It's basically how the brightness of a thing changes as a function of time. And by looking at things like that, we can study the transient sky and understand what happens. Like, what really is this thing that comes and goes in a matter of a few days, or sometimes a few minutes or seconds, as a matter of fact. And I don't want to get into the details of this plot, but by looking at this curve that I showed earlier, you can measure how bright things get at the peak. 
and you can measure how long it takes for them to get right. And then you can plot them in this figure that I'm showing in this next slide and say, okay, the x-axis shows how many days does it get something to get bright. And the y-axis shows how bright does it get. And as a matter of fact, there's things out there that get as bright as one trillion times the brightness of the sun. That is a lot. Take the sun's brightness in a beautiful summer day in Baton Rouge, multiply it by one trillion, and this is how bright those things get, supernova explosions. Now, how do we find them? This picture up here is a picture that I took at the uh, uh, McDonald Observatory in West Texas. I used to be a graduate student there at the University of Texas before I came here. And this little telescope right here that looks like R2-D2 from Star Wars <laughs> is called ROTSI, Robotic Optical Transient Search Experiment. And, you know, there's just so many things that go bust in every single night that you don't have enough astronomers in the world to stare at the sky and find them. So your best shot is to use robots. So as a matter of fact, we've built telescopes like this, which you can see here in real time, that scans the night every single minute, takes pictures of the sky over and over again, and tries to find things that were not there before, transients, new things, something that might indicate that an explosion happened in this part of the sky. So we have to use the power of robotics to be able to do this work in accuracy. And this is one example. Of course, in the future, we'll be able to do it much better. In 2025, there is a mission called Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, or LSST. It's cost you about half a billion dollars, and it's going to discover one million transits a night. Now, we don't have enough graduate students to pay to do all this data analysis. So we we'll actually have to use robots and artificial intelligence, sorry, graduate students, and artificial intelligence to actually analyze this massive amounts of data for us. So with this massive amounts of data, we'll be using artificial intelligence to find new things that happen in the sky. Now, one of my favorite things that goes bust, one of my favorite space banks that I study personally, supernova explosions. Now, the stars that I talked about before that are more than 10, 20 times the mass of the sun, they kind of live fast and furious lifestyles. As James Dean used to put it, live fast, die young. Those guys will consume all the fuel that they have, and they will end up blowing up, dying in a massive catastrophic supernova explosion. I want you to think of stars as factories that create new elements. You know, they take lighter elements like hydrogen and slowly they build up heavier elements like iron that we all know about. Well, it turns out that when massive stars build iron, that's the point of no return. Nothing else can happen. This iron core of this massive star is going to collapse and produce a catastrophic explosion that we call supernova. Now, how bright are the supernovae? That's a real question. So, I looked at my Louisiana energy bill, and they charge about two cents per kilowatt hour from Louisiana. And then I converted that to how much you would have to pay to power a supernova. And the answer is a billion, trillion, trillion dollars. Now, that's a large number, the way I say to you, but in terms of the, my home country's national debt, it's only 1%. So, it's not bad. But we can still afford both sometimes. Now, if you want to see, if you, wanna, if you were able to use all this energy that's produced by a supernova explosion to power the, the electric grid of the United States, you probably, you'd be able to do it for one billion, billion years. This is how much energy is radiated away when a supernova, when a star blows up. You could power the entire US energy grid forever, effectively. Now, this is an animation that I like to show that basically zooms in into the heart, into the core of a massive star, or collapsed supernova. And as you will see over time, this star is making up heavier and heavier stuff. Eventually, you will see a, a white dot in the center, which is the, the iron core of this massive star. The star is about 20 times the mass of the sun. And this iron core is gonna collapse, and you will see it happen. it's coming up, there it is. It's gonna collapse and produce this powerful explosion. Supernova ejecta around this core is gonna be distributed, it's gonna fly away in the surrounding space. And what's gonna left behind after this explosion could become something really, really weird, like a neutron star, 
very weird compact star about the size of Baton Rouge or a black hole. So those things produce some of, some of the most exotic objects in the universe. Now, we saw one of these things by 1987. We call it Supernova 1987A. And as a matter of fact, we were able to study the supernova really, really, really well because it was relatively nearby to the Earth. It was actually in a neighboring galaxy, a satellite galaxy of our Milky Way galaxy that we call the Large Magellanic Cloud, about 170,000 light years away. Now, one light, year, one light year is the distance that the light travels within one year. That means that when we actually saw this explosion, it happened about 170,000 years in the past. Now think about the human evolution, you know, uh, the story starting from the Homo sapiens all the way to where we are today. It's approximately about the same time scale. So it took about the same time for the light from this supernova to get to the Earth as it took humanity to evolve all the way from the Homo sapiens to where we are today to building the Empire State of Being. So that's incredible in itself. But because the things that was so close to the Earth, we're able to study it in detail. And we use some of the world's most powerful telescopes, like the Hubble Space Telescope, to look, to zoom into it and look at it in, in great detail. And this picture right here shows you what it looks like if you zoom in. And what you see is not this beautiful, pristine picture of a spherical star that's just expanding away. You see this weird ring of material around it. And I'm gonna come back to that a little later. But another cool thing about the supernova is that we actually had taken a picture of the star that blew up before it blew up. We looked in archival images, digital images of, of stars in the field where Supernova 987A took place, and we found this star. And we were able to confirm that indeed, that star is not there anymore, blew up as a supernova. That was a really massive 15, 20 solar mass star that actually exploded, 20 times the mass of the sun or so. So that's incredible. We're able to confirm our theories about what this supernova is. Anyway. Now, this is a video that was taken over the last four decades uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope. And what that shows is how the supernova 987A evolved over the years. And as you can see, what really happens is this explosion is enshrouded in this weird material, this ring-shaped thing, these blobs. And when the supernova reaches those blobs, it fires them up. It makes them look bright. And that's what you see in this video that I just played for you. This is Hubble Space Telescope data over the last 40 years. We're actually seeing it happen in real time. Now, the, the death of a massive star is not the only way to get a massive explosion. Sometimes, actually, most of the stars in the sky, more than 50% of the stars in the sky, they live in pairs. They're born so close together that they're symbiotic in a way. They live together in a binary star system. And they interact with each other. Sometimes those interactions can be extreme to the point that they can induce a different kind of explosion that we call a thermonuclear supernova. Those thermonuclear supernova explosions are actually much brighter than the explosions that we get from the death of the massive star. As a matter of fact, they're so bright that back in 2011, astronomers were able to use them to constrain the properties of the universe because the brighter something else, the further away you can see it from. So if you look at those bright type 1A supernova at really large distances, you're able to constrain the basic properties of the universe itself. It's geometry, for example and what is the universe made of, and what's the fate of the universe. And that's what led to a Nobel Prize for these people back in 2011. Supernova space banks led to a Nobel Prize back in 2011 for constraining the properties of the universe. Now, what happens later? Now, this is one of my favorite pictures in the Milky Way galaxy. This is the so-called Crab Nebula. Back in 1054, Chinese astronomers were able to record, and actually they saw with their naked eye, even during the daytime, that's how bright it was, they could see during the daytime the explosion of a massive star in our Milky Way galaxy. That was supernova 1054. They recorded that about a thousand years ago. If you look at the same place today, that's what you see with the Hubble Space Telescope and other telescopes. You see this beautiful crab nebula, the supernova remnant, this 
leftover ashes of a dead star expanding away in space. And if you look closely in the heart of this nebula, you will find one of the weirdest objects in the universe, a pulsar, a, a very dense neutron star, something about the size of Baton Rouge. You couldn't even take a spoonful out of it. A spoonful out of a neutron star will weigh way more than the Empire State. So this is a very dense star that's left, a very exotic star that's left over from this explosion. Now, there's a few more pictures that I have with supernova remnants. This is Cassiopeia A, this is another beautiful event. That one actually was discovered originally, was seen by one of the most famous astronomers in Europe uh, back in the Renaissance ages, Tycho Brahe, a Danish astronomer. And if you look at him today, that's how it looks like. And this is another one. But what I want you to take away from these pictures is that stars are not these beautiful spherical cows that we thought they were. They're not these beautiful big round balls of gas that we always assumed they were. When a star explodes, it has a very weird shape and morphology. In other words, stars are three-dimensional, of course, and are way more complicated than just spheres of gas. Now, back in 2005, we had a spectacular discovery that came out of Texas, as a matter of fact, a few years before I became a graduate student there. And by using these robotic telescope techniques, we were able for the first time to discover an explosion that was even brighter a space bank that was even 10 to 100 times brighter than the brightest supernovae we'd ever seen up to that point. That is why we call it a superluminous supernovae. And after 2005, we actually found, so far we found more than 100 of these things. Those are the brightest stellar explosions we found today. And we're still trying to understand, that's part of my work, what gives rise to this spectacular, rare, energetic, luminous, stellar explosions. And some theories involved stars that are not just 10, 20 times the mass of the sun, but stars that are 100, 200, three times the mass of the sun. Monsters. Sometimes you might even have stars that are just rotating really fast around their axis, and somehow they can use this rotation to enhance their energy and become really bright. Or you have stars surrounded by dirt. What do I mean by that? That's another misconception. We used to think about stars as surrounded by this beautiful, empty black space, this clean black space around them. Well, the reality couldn't be much different. This is one of probably my favorite objects in the Milky Way galaxy. I know I said that before. I have many favorites. But this one shows uh, the Ida Carina Nebula. And in the heart of this nebula, there is a, a massive binary system that hides two stars of about 60 to 80 times the mass of the sun each. So there's, in the heart of this nebula, there's two really massive stars. And something happened back in the 1850s that astronomers were able to detect. Astronomers in the 1850s, as a matter of fact, they saw an outburst coming from this system, and they wrote it down and they took some measurements. Now, if you go back with the Hubble Space Telescope, and you look at it, that's how it looks like. What really happened was an outburst. Something happened in one of those massive stars that ejected this beautiful material around the star that created this bipolar nebula shape. The reason I'm showing this to you right now is because I want to make the point that stars are not, massive stars are not necessarily surrounded by empty space. They're most likely surrounded by really complicated, dirty material that was ejected by them at some time before they became supernova. Now, you, some of you may imagine where I'm going with this argument. Where I'm going with this argument is that when those stars blow up, they will blow up within a very complicated environment, and they will interact with it. And that can make stars and supernova become really, really bright. That's a way to make supernova super luminous. This is a few more examples of material around massive stars that are not clean quite complicated. Now, as I said before, stars are not spherical cows. They're actually three-dimensional things. And uh, what I do at LSU is actually I'm a theoretical astrophysicist. I use uh, computers to try and understand how stars work and how stars blow up. But that sounds easy to say, but it's actually really hard to do. Because to properly understand what happens inside stars 
in the moments before they become supernova explosions, you have to do a lot of complicated physics. And not only that, you have to do a lot of complicated physics in every single part of the star. In a computer model, you have to break up your star in small pieces and study the physics in each one of these pieces inside the star. You have to make a model of the star, and you have to do it over time. That's what we call a supernova simulation. Now, those don't come cheap. And the way they don't come cheap is because a massive star is about one billion miles radius. Now, if you really want to do the physics accurate, you, can, you have to get down to scales that are about a tenth of a mile radius. So if you divide one billion by 0.1 mile, you will see that you need a lot of zones, a lot of pieces to be able to resolve this star in a computer. So obviously, I'm sorry to say that, but most of your laptops will be useless. So we won't be able to do that probably. So that's why we have to use these guys. Those are some of my favorite things in the world. Those are supercomputers. This particularly is the mirror supercomputer housed at the Argonne National uh, Laboratory in Illinois. It cost $100 million to install this machine. And it costs about $1 million a year to run it. Electricity does not come cheap. You know, you, you don't only have the electricity to keep the computer going, but you have to use uh, you know, cooling methods like AC, think of it as an AC, as a cooling method to keep those computers cool while they're running. Because if you didn't have that, that would get really hot. So the electric bill is really expensive to run those things. So you can take that and multiply, you can take your, your personal laptops and multiply it by 700,000. And that's the amount of power we get with the supercomputers. Another example that I like to use is that if you were to simulate the explosion of a massive star with your laptop, it would take you approximately 5,000 years. Good luck with that. With a supercomputer, it takes you about three days. That's why we need those things. Now, there's a few more examples of these supercomputers. There's uh, all kinds of, actually, here in Louisiana, at LSU, we have the Center for uh, Computation Theory that actually houses one of the of one, one nice supercomputer that we're using to do these studies. But here's a few more pictures of these things. Sometimes I wish I could mine Bitcoin in one of these things. <laughs> That's how I'm going to get my vote. How else am I going to get my vote? But when you do this, and when you use one of these supercomputers to simulate the explosion of massive stars, you usually create simulations that look like this. And what that shows, I don't want to get into the complexity, it's just a model of what happens inside a massive star before it blows up as a, as a supernova. And what you see here is that it's not a spherical, round, beautiful thing. It's actually very terrible. You see all this turbulence going on in several parts of the star. Real stars, real three-dimensional stars are not perfectly spherical. They're very asymmetric. They're very turbulent. And this turbulence is going to play a role about how stars explode as supernova. This is another example. This is a three-dimensional simulation run with a supercomputer. It took about 50 million computer hours to run the simulation. It means take your laptop, it would take you about 50 million hours to run this completely and get some results out of it. Now, why do we do this? Because this offers a prediction about how supernova. We make predictions about how supernova and stars blow up. And then we can compare these predictions to actual observations of the things like the thing I showed you before, the light curve, the light that goes up and down. That's what you see with a telescope. So the whole point is trying to fit this data with your models and then understand what kind of star is behind this massive catastrophe. Now, I want to answer quickly a question that most of you are probably wondering here is, can a supernova kill us? Can a supernova wipe out the human civilization? Well, it turns out some of you might probably have looked up the Orion constellation and there's a there's a star up there called Betelgeuse. That star is pretty bright and it's actually pretty old. Betelgeuse is going to explode. I don't know, I can't promise it's gonna be within our lifetimes, but it could be within the next, you know, ten thousand years. But you know that's a good enough time scale, a short enough time scale compared to the things that happen in space. So Betelgeuse, if Betelgeuse blew up, Betelgeuse is about four hundred light years away from us. If it blew up, it wouldn't have a big effect. 
in order to get something to affect the human civilization, to affect the survival of the human race, you would have to have something within about 50 light years away from the Earth, which is pretty rare, so I wouldn't lose my sleep over it. However, what probably most of you might not realize is that a supernova explosion in itself is not going to completely wipe out our, our planet. What it's actually going to do is going to wipe out the ozone layer. And by wiping out the ozone layer, it's going to expose every single one of you to a pretty beautiful tan. Like, actually, I don't know if it's beautiful because you would all die. But that's the way that a supernova can kill us. It's very, very unlikely. Very unlikely. So I wouldn't lose my sleep over it. And finally, I want to end with, why do we do all these things? Probably some of you recognize Carl Sagan right here. He says, we're made of star stuff. We're a way for the cosmos to understand itself. So we're basically atoms and molecules that rearranged in a way that created this beautiful, intelligent brain that allows us to understand the cosmos. And supernova is a very, uh, and cosmic explosions and cosmic space banks is actually a very central point to this idea because space banks create the elements, the, the, the building blocks that make up life in our universe. Things that make you and me, like you know, oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, and so on and so forth. Now, there's more than that. Supernova is pretty bright. There's space banks, very, very bright things. And you can find them at really, really large distances that help you understand the properties of the universe itself. On top of that, supernovae allow you to understand how stars, how massive, extreme stars live and die, and the environments they die within. But another byproduct that some people overlook, and I think it's very important personally, is that, believe it or not, supernova science has a, has a direct influence in your daily lives at some level, because by doing this, we're developing algorithms, we're developing computing techniques, we're developing artificial intelligence techniques, developing software that doesn't only have an application for supernova or science, but could be applied to a variety of things. So with that, I want to end. And thank you all for your attention. And go out there and look at Beetlejuice every night. You never know. So with that, we'll take questions from Anos. Yes. So when you, when you talk about the iron core collapsing, well, down in the heart of a massive star, the density and the temperature is extreme. And at this point, you are so hot that you can start nuclear fusion of elements from something that's lighter to something that's heavier over time. And uh, eventually, you start with hydrogen. By the way, hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, followed by helium. And that's what most stars start their lives with. But over time, they build up to heavier and heavier things. Carbon, silicon, oxygen. Eventually, they get in hot enough that they can actually fuse silicon and other things to iron. But iron is a special element. You can't extract energy from iron. It's a very special element. So that is why it's the end point of stellar, massive stellar evolution. Because if you can't extract energy from something, the only the only thing it can do is collapse and produce this explosion. Yes, sir. Um, the program is using, uh, dynamics, gas dynamics, and on, 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 on. Oh, uh, I, I'm glad you're asking that because the supernova explosion problem is uh, one of the most challenging problems in physics as a whole. And for somebody to approach realistic models, you have to use all of the above. You have to use knowledge from all of these disciplines that you just referred to. Quantum mechanics, gas dynamics, relativity sometimes, some gravitational waves, you know, are produced by supernova. So really, the entire ballpark of physics is relevant to what happens in a supernova explosion. Yes, ma'am.
I really like this question because that is a question that all of us physicists have to answer before we even use one of these things. And you know, we live in a universe, the backstage of this universe is space and time. So whatever model we're doing, we're doing it in the context of space and time. And as much as we resolve, the better we can resolve space, and the better we can resolve uh, time, the better answers we're gonna get. So one of the main things we're doing when we're studying the stars is asking the question, okay, what is the absolute minimum scale, spatial scale, that we need to consider to properly approximate reality, right? So we come up with, we use physics, we use laws, we come up with a, with a length scale. We do the same thing for the time scale, for you know, what's the minimum time we need to use to simulate the solar. And then we're using this as the absolute criteria, uh, as the basis upon which we have to design our simulation. We have to design it down to as closer to this resolution that's physical, physically important as possible. So that is what drives our thinking. Physics. Yes, sir. On the space scale, you said it was about 0.5 miles. What's your step size on the time scale? Well, very good question as well. So actually, the time scale depends on what part of the life of, of the star you're looking at. Uh, the sun, for example, it's a, it's a wonderful star. We love it. But it's also very boring astronomically because it's just fusing hydrogen to helium in its core, and it's going to be doing this for the next five billion years. So that's a huge time scale. Nothing interesting is happening within that huge time scale. So you could actually approximate this with much finer time resolution. But when you're looking at the last few moments of a massive star before it blows up as a supernova, things change within the, the matter of days or even hours. When you're looking down to the actual collapse of the star within the matter of milliseconds. So it depends on what regime you're looking at. So that's a very good question. You, know, you have to dis decide in a smart way what to use that's feasible to do with your supercomputer and do it accurately enough. Yes? Very good thing. So, as of two years ago, we live in the era of, actually as of one year ago perhaps, we live in the era of what we call multi-messenger astronomy, which means that for millennia we only had light, you know. We, we didn't have the luxury that the biologists or the chemists had of analyzing something in a laboratory under a microscope. The things we care about are beyond our reach currently. So. The only thing we were able to do is uh, analyze the light, the signals that come to us. So light has been the number one thing for many, many years in astronomy. But of course, lately we have gravitational waves, a new window to the universe. We have other things like neutrinos we can use to study several things. Uh, so to answer your question, most of the models we have right now in terms of making predictions of the light of the supernova seem to do a very good job. We still have problem, however, understanding the very physics of the collapse, whether it always happens, whether every single massive star is actually going to produce an explosion, or there's another chance that some massive stars were actually directly collapsed to make a black hole. So we're still trying to figure out the answer to that question. It's still open, open research. Okay, so thank you for coming. I'm going to talk today about cosmology. So, okay. Okay. So the first question is, what is cosmology? And here is where the very first lesson of the night comes. Cosmology is not cosmology, and you should never mix both concepts, so don't forget that. So cosmology is, in fact, the, the science that studies the universe regarded as a whole. So the focus here is not on constituents. We don't pay attention to planets, uh, galaxies, uh, stars by themselves. This is what astronomy or astrophysics is. 
cosmology pays attention to the global structure of all celestial bodies as a whole. So we are here in front of the amazing challenge of trying to understand the whole universe. So we need to face important philosophical uh, and deep questions like, you know, is the universe infinite in, in space or does it have a finite extension? It is eternal, has been existing forever, or did it have a beginning some time ago? It is static, unchangeable, or is dynamical, evolving? Yesterday was different, and tomorrow will be different. So as you can imagine, this question, this question has been discussed uh, by many uh, developed civilizations in history. But the point is that most of the ideas were heavily based on philosophical uh, reasoning in mystical and mythical ideas and religion. And, but modern cosmology is something else. In modern cosmology, we use the scientific method to try to understand the reality of the cosmos, how nature works. So here, my opinion or my ideas are you know, what I believe personally is completely irrelevant. I left them at home before going to my office every single day. My goal is to describe reality. So our goal here is to describe the past, explain the present, and predict the future. And we use data, observations, to confirm that our ideas are correct. So the first thing, the first thing I want to do tonight is to tell you about the structure of the cosmos today. So I think it's sure that this is a question that every single of you have wondered for instance, looking at a beautiful sky during the night, how is matter distributed across the cosmos? What is the large scale structure of the universe? So let me start with our home planet, the Earth. I will show you some, some numbers so you, you have an idea of the scales that I am talking about. The radius of the Earth, around 4,000 miles. The Sun, our home star, the radius 10 times bigger, 40,000 miles. The distance between them has three more zeros on it. So are, we are talking about almost 100 million uh, miles. But the Sun is not the only planet orbiting the, sorry, the Earth is not the only planet orbiting the Sun. There are a bunch of them. They form our solar system. The size of the solar system, for instance, the distance from the Sun to Pluto has three more zeros. And we are talking about billions of miles. So what about other stars? So other stars, the closest system of stars that we have is Alpha Centauri. And they are far away around, we are talking about tens of thousands of billions of miles. And these numbers are getting ridiculous, so it is better to use other units, like a light year, which is the distance that light travels in a whole year. Alpha Centauri is four light years away. So four light years, light needs four years to get into the Earth from here. Just to give you a comparison, light takes eight minutes to travel from the Earth to the Sun. But what about other stars? How are stars distributed? Are they just uniformly spread across the cosmos? Or do they get together in groups? It happens that they get together in groups. Groups of, galax of stars are called galaxies. Our own galaxy is the Milky Way. It is a huge conglomerate of star, stars and dust. It has around 100, 200 billions of stars, like our Sun. And many of these stars have their own planets orbiting around. And it's huge. Light will take around 100,000 years to cross the Milky Way. 100,000 years light to cross the Milky Way. So these are huge ones. What about ga other galaxies in the universe? It happens that galaxies gather together to form galaxy groups. Our group, the group that Milky Way belongs, is called the local group and has around 50 other galaxies. But group of galaxies get together to form clusters and superclusters of galaxies. We belong to the Virgo supercluster that contains around 100 uh, uh, galaxy groups. And what about ga galaxy superclusters? It happens that they get together to form the largest structure that we see today. 
but they don't gather in a spherical uh, you know, groups. Rather, they gather together, forming like filaments with voids in between, very much like the fabric of my picture, if you look at it with a microscope. And I call that the cosmic fabric. So to summarize, the structure of the cosmos is made of this large scale structure, the cosmic fabric. It is made of zillions and zillions of galaxy superclusters. Each of them made of galaxy clusters and made of galaxy groups. Each of them made of many galaxies. And each galaxy is made of billions of stars. And, and each star, many stars have planets around them. And in some planets, at least in one of them, there are physicists and people together in bats talking about the structure of the universe. So this is the structure. Let's talk about now evolution. So here I want to, 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 to ask two questions, different questions. The first question is, has the universe existed forever? Or did it, that, does it have a beginning in the past? And a different question is, it is static, the same during the whole eternity, or it is changing dynamically somehow? Uh, just to give you a brief example of, of, you know, of, of ideas that we can find in history books, the Greeks, they thought that the universe was eternal, always the same. On the other hand, ideas coming from religion, uh, mainly, they, they, they proposed that the universe had a beginning sometime in the past. The great philosopher, Immanuel Kant, used to challenge this idea by asking, you know, if the universe had a beginning, what was there before? But as I said, you know, most of these ideas are, are, are just, you know, based on philosophy, mythical, or religious arguments. In order to have a precise scientific answer, we had to wait until about 100 years ago. And the key point was coming from this gentleman that all of you know, Professor Albert Einstein. This is the, 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 the greatest creation of Albert Einstein was the general theory of relativity. And you know, I was strongly advised to not show equations in this talk, but I couldn't resist, I'm sorry. I couldn't resist to show you one of the most beautiful, profound, and deep creations of the human mind the general theory of relativity. This theory predicts many things for us, from the motion, the, you know, the trajectory of planets in the solar system, to the formation of galaxies, to, 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 to what a black hole is, and the way two black holes collide and emit gravity waves. And we have confirmed in observations most of the predictions of this theory. So we trust it very well. So the question is, what this theory tell us about the universe itself, about the whole cosmos? So in summary, this theory tells us that the universe is not static. The universe is dynamical. It was very different in the past, and it will be very different in the future. More precisely, the universe is expanding. And you can ask, you know, what do you mean by expanding? What I mean is that every single galaxy cluster and superclusters, they are moving apart from each other. They are getting, you know, the universe is getting more and more diluted to the future, it was denser in the past. So, so it's like if I stretch the, my fabric, the fabric of the cosmos gets stretched and everything gets farther away from everything. So to give you a pictorial uh, idea, uh, I want to use this cartoon. Uh, time flows vertically up. The present is the top part. The past is the, is the bottom part. And we see that today in the present, we have all this structure in the universe, this cosmic uh, fabric. But if we go to the past, everything was closer together, closer together, the universe was denser and hotter. And if we keep going together, all the material that we see in the stars and galaxies, etc., they were so close together that we didn't have any structure anymore. What we had was a soup of, you know, just fundamental particles together interacting with radiation, forming, you know, a very dense and hot soup. And if we keep extrapolating that idea into the past, we get that the whole universe had volume zero at the, some time in the past. Because of these two reasons, hot and dense past, and this zero volume, this theory is called the hot Big Bang. The Big Bang because this zero volume. 
So this is what this theory is telling to us. But you know, we are doing science. You shouldn't believe me. You should tell me that, you know. How can I make sure that this is true? This is not science fiction. This is really describing reality. So what cosmologists do is to take this model and carefully work out the predictions of this model. So predictions, something that we haven't measured before. And then build telescopes, uh, satellites, and other devices to carefully check if these predictions are true or not. If they are not true, the theory is wrong. And it happens that most of the predictions of this theory have been confirmed uh, with great accuracy. Just to give you a few examples, we have measured that all distance galaxies are moving away from us, every single galaxy. The universe is expanding. We have measured one of the predictions of this model is the existence of the so-called cosmic microwave background. We have measured the abundance of light elements in the universe, and a big, uh, and a long, and very impressive, etc. So we trust very much this theory at the present time. We are very sure that the universe is expanding, and we understand pretty well what is the past history of the universe during the last, let's say, 13 billion years. So this is the picture of the universe, hot and dense, and at the very beginning, we had what we call the Big Bang. And you know, Manos, I'm sorry, <laughs> you show very nice explosions, but you cannot compete with the Big Bang. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to finish this part just with a couple of comments. So first, this theory of the Big Bang model was not the only theory in the market. We always mention it because it's the one that is true. But we had many theories competing with each other. How we design observations. Observations tell us which theory is right and which one is wrong. So it doesn't matter what I like or what I don't like. Observations tell me what theory is describing the universe. And the second thing I want to say is that Einstein, Albert Einstein himself, he couldn't believe what his theory was telling to him. His theory was telling that the, the universe is expanding. And he was so biased against you know, a dynamical universe, he really wanted the universe to be static, the same. That, that he couldn't believe his theory. Even more, he modified his theory by hand, a posteriori, in order to make this prediction not to appear anymore. However, observations were telling him, you know, the universe is expanding. Even if you don't like, the universe is expanding. And eventually, he called his modification the biggest error of his life. So this is a very good example of the way science works. It's not what I like or what I prefer. It's what nature is. If my theory doesn't agree with nature, my theory is simply wrong. OK, so the last part of, 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 of this talk is the following. Probably what I have said, you have heard before or read somewhere. Uh, I'm going to tell you something now that perhaps you have. So after all, we are doing science. And I have to question every single thing uh, we have. So in particular, you know, I have said that we understand very well the last 13 billion years of the universe is expanding, etc. And if we extrapolate that, we get you know, the zero volume uh, origin. I want to put a question mark on that. So I want now you know, to take very seriously the question, what evidence we have today about the fact that the universe began 13 billion years ago. What real evidence we have, both in theory and observations. And after studying that carefully, I'm going to list the evidence that we have. We have none. <laughs> we have none. So regarding theory, so the Big Bang is not a prediction of Einstein's theory. You know, we know that Einstein's theory of relativity loses validity before reaching the Big Bang. When the universe is very dense and very, very, very hot, we know from our experience in the lab that quantum mechanics is essential to describe physics theory. And Einstein's theory doesn't incorporate quantum mechanics. So we simply don't trust what Einstein's theory tells us about the very, very, very early universe. We trust this for, 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 for these 13 billion years, but not for this very extreme region. So the Big Bang is not a prediction of the theory. Rather, it's the result of pushing the theory beyond its domain of validity. So the, this theory doesn't predict the Big Bang. Regarding observations, 
perhaps you have read or, 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 or heard that, that the observation of the cosmic microwave background is a confirmation of the Big Bang theory. It's, in fact, it's a confirmation of the, of the fact that the universe has been expanding for a huge amount of time and was hotter and dense, but it is not a confirmation that the universe began 14 years ago. You know, the CMB, this, this, this background was created much later in the universe. So it, we don't have access so far to that region of the universe, to the real beginning. So we simply don't know what happened. It's a question mark. So I have to take this picture and remove the band and put a big question mark. So after all, Manos, you know, perhaps, you know, I'm not sure if I have a better band than you or not. <laughs> So what we have to do is to think a little bit more. But this is what we do. This is our model. And in particular, this is what we do in here, in LSU. So in LSU, myself and my group of research, what we try to do is to, to take the principles of quantum mechanics and incorporate them to general relativity, to Einstein theory, and to make a theory that includes the principles of quantum mechanics. The theory that we are trying to build is called loop quantum gravity. And that theory is suitable to describe the extreme regions of the universe, the very beginning. So, first question, what does this theory tell us about that instance? And, you know, what this theory tells us is that this region, this zero volume point, was not the beginning, but if you want, the midpoint of the entire evolution. The universe was contracting before for a huge amount of time. It reached a minimum size, and then quantum effects come in and make the universe to bounce, and it starts expanding. And it happens that we live in the expanding part. So in this theory, there is no big bang, but there is a big bounce. But again, we are scientists. Why should I believe this theory and not your theory or your theory? So we need to go and, and try to see what observations we can make to confirm or rule out that theory. And this is where my, my work uh, appears. So my job here in LSU is trying to see what observations can give us information about what really happened there, and use the results to rule out or confirm this theory. So I want to finish just summarizing the main points of, of the main take home points of this talk. First, remember, Cosmetology and cosmology are different things. <laughs> Second, we have a theory of general relativity that explains very well our universe during the last 13 billion years and tells us that the past was hotter and denser, the future will be colder and, and more dilute, and, and the universe is expanding. Third, that theory doesn't predict a Big Bang. So every time you listen to that, remember, Einstein theory doesn't predict a Big Bang. We are pushing too far that theory. We don't believe the predictions of that theory on that project. And people is working on better theories, and some of them, like look quantum gravity, tell us that there is no bank, but there is a balance. And our, our work is to see if that really happens. And four, and or five, I don't remember, maybe the most interesting point is that there are a lot of questions that have to be answered. There is a lot of extremely fascinating lessons to be learned. And all of you, in particular young people, are very welcome to join this fascinating intellectual adventure. So I want to finish this talk with this very nice uh, sentence by the great uh, Richard Feynman that summarizes very well what is the spirit of science. And I want to thank you for, for your attention. in an accelerating way, an 
and eventually we'll reach a minimum and we will have a bounce. After that, we'll expand. Accelerating will never re-collapse again. So there will be only one bounce, and that's all, because the universe will keep expanding forever. So, so, so both things are perfectly compatible. Thank you. Um, so there's a party or a family dinner Thanksgiving. Don't talk about cosmology in a party. I don't from experience. Do you have anything better than that? <laughs> uh, my answer would be no. Then, then you are welcome to join my yeah. efforts. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there are, you know, putting together gravity and quantum mechanics, this general theory of relativity and quantum mechanics, is something extremely, extremely difficult, just at the mathematical level. And, and you know, we don't have many data to choose between different proposals. So you could imagine that there are thousands of different ideas to do it. But it happens that there are just a handful, at most. Why? Because these two ideas are extremely, extremely challenging. So, so this is why you know, there are just maybe two main candidates and another ones which are, which are smaller. Uh, uh, so just having one of them working approximately well is already an achievement. So, so from the mathematical and physical viewpoint, viewpoint, you know, any of these ideas are worth exploring. Only because you know, having themselves per se, per se is already a big, a big achievement. Blue quantum gravity is one of them. I like it more probably because it's more uh, in accordance to my knowledge or, or my taste, but, but, but I don't know which, which one is true. Any of them that you want to, to, to follow, that will be perfectly fine. But again, don't talk about quantum gravity in a, <laughs> in a part. Um, in, the, in the face of the universe before the big crunch, when the universe is shrinking, does blue quantum gravity predict that time goes backwards in the sense that entropy tends to decrease? Yeah, that is a very good question, and, and there is no complete uh, answer. Uh, because, because, you know, uh, uh, this theory has been built itself. So, uh, in fact, uh, quantum gravity only, is only relevant very close to this bounds, when matter is extremely, extremely dense and gravity is extremely, extremely strong. Away from that, both to the future and to the past, the effects of quantum gravity are completely negligible, as small as in this room, and you can forget about that. So you could apply standard general relativity when you are away from that. So whether entropy grows, uh, away from the bounds rather than the future is something mathematically possible. I, I don't believe it is the case, but again, what I believe or I like as a matter in nature, we have to prove the proof it, and at this point we don't have any strong proof. a very good question. In fact, uh, you know, there are two places where the theory of general relativity breaks down, which is in the, you know, near the Big Bang, but also in another very extreme region, which is inside this, this, this big explosion when you form a black hole. If you have a black hole and you go inside a black hole, Einstein's theory of relativity reaches its limit. So what happens at the center of a black hole? If you keep going, what are you going to find? Are you going to, to appear in a different universe? That would be a kind of bounce. Because black holes attracts everything, and you know, it's possible that you will appear somewhere. We just don't know. This is another, another of the ideas that are being pushed uh, in LSU, and Horst Bulli is an expert on that. You can ask, ask him in that, in that table. And, and, and the physics and the mathematics are very similar to this to this band. So it is it is possible that something very similar happens at the center of a of a black hole. You posit 
that the bounce can only happen a finite number of times, um, what would you say happened before then? What? And, uh, what, what, what happened before then? Would it, would, did it all start with the Big Bang and then no. subsequent so, bounces? Or? So in this in this proposal, the universe is eternal, has existed forever. There is no beginning of time. You can go to the past as far as you want, and to the past, to the past and to the future. So the beginning of the universe was a very empty and diluted universe, infinitely long, con contracting. Contracting very slowly, but you know, we had all the eternity in front of us for the contraction. So after many years, the universe reached a minimum size and then bounced and starts expanding again, and then we will expand forever and forever. So just one bounce and eternal, eternal universe. So this is very curious historically, because when people uh, uh, propose this idea of a Big Bang, of an origin of the universe, most scientists were just you know, very much against that. They just said, how is possible that time has an origin, a beginning? That was you know, philosophically horrible. Einstein didn't like that, you know, and the big uh, people at the time didn't like that. But you know, during the years, you know, the, the, the mood has changed, and now people feel comfortable with the idea of the origin of time, which to me is quite a quite, you know, big jam in my brain. And, but, you know, it has, has gotten to the people. And when you said that now we are considering that time doesn't have a beginning, we have the same reaction. Oh, it's possible that time, time doesn't have a beginning. So, you know, just throw away your bias. You know, we don't know what happens. I don't know. I, I can't like it more in one way or the other, but again, that doesn't matter in nature. So let's see what the universe is telling to us. And let's try to find observations to guide us. All right, so looks like we have time for one more. If you're holding your hand up there in the back. So what indication do we have for this big bounce theory instead of just a big bang? I mean, what if there's an original universe that's convened on this infinitesimally small point, why do we add it there? That is a wonderful question. This, in fact, summarizes my work. <laughs> you know, what I want to do, what I really want to know is if there is something in the cosmos, in particular in the cosmic microwave background, or the way galaxies are distributed, that tells me what happened at the time. Some, some imprint from that time that, you know, that can tell me unambiguously if the universe began there or done, because I just want to know it. So, so my, my goal is just to find the imprint of that, of that time and, and, and then use observations to decide what, what really happened.